So this is a part of a series of talks of based on the third edition of the WFH guidelines for the management of hemophilia. And this is a reference for the published document. So my name is Pradeep Punus, and I work at the Christian Medical College in Wello, India. And I have no competing interest to declare. I would like to thank my co-chair, Dr. Brian Feldman, Dr. Alok Srivastava, and all the other authors who have helped me with this project. Now, outcome refers to the condition of a patient that results from a disease or medical intervention and can be assessed using generic and disease-specific assessment tools. Now, why do we need to measure outcome? To follow an individual's disease course, one needs to follow this with outcomes across a timeline. Measurement of outcomes help us, helps us obtain information that guide routine clinical care as well as assess response to therapy. It is also useful to quantify the health of a group of patients, and on follow-up, it is possible to measure the quality of care given. These outcome measurements can then be used to advocate for resources when required. Now, outcomes cover two aspects, disease-related outcomes and therapy-related outcomes. With respect to the former, Effectiveness of the hemostatic therapy can be measured by assessing the impact on the frequency of bleeding, as well as the impact it has on musculoskeletal system and the psychosocial impact it has on the individual. The frequency of bleeding, particularly joint and muscle bleeds, and the response to treatment have been the most important indicators of the effectiveness of hemostatic therapy and the best surrogate predictors of long-term musculoskeletal outcomes. Now, the Scientific and Standardization Committee of the ISTH defined a joint bleed as an unusual sensation or aura in the joint, usually perceived by the patient in combination with increasing swelling or warmth of the skin over the joint, increasing pain, progressive loss of range of movement, or difficulty in using the limbus compared with the baseline. And a muscle bleed was defined as an episode of bleeding into a muscle determined clinically and or by imaging studies, generally associated with pain and or swelling and loss of movement over the baseline. Now the WFH recommends ensuring that the frequency of all bleeds is documented in real time by patients or caregivers, preferably with a bleed diary and reviewed together at least annually with particular reference to an intra-articular, intramuscular and central nervous system bleeds, including their recovery status. Until two decades ago, so the severity of joint arthropathy was assessed by the bleeding frequency, the clinical score, that's a Gilbert score, and the radiological score. However, these measures were not standardized, they were insensitive to early change, and they did not take into account normal childhood variants. Additionally, they missed out some important factors. Now, take this child who had to crawl from place to place because of the contractures. Now, he underwent serial casting and surgery to correct the deformities. Now, this was his functional ability after initial therapy and surgery. His radiological scores had not changed, nor had his clinical score, but his ability to engage in activities and move around had considerably improved. Now, this highlighted the lacuna in the existing assessment tools. So hence in hemophilia by the early 2000s, it was recognized that the outcomes should be assessed according to the domains in the International Classification of Functioning, Disability and Health, or the ICF, uh, the model uh, recommended by the WHO. Now, according to the ICF, evaluation of disability and health should focus on the impact of the disease on body structures and function, activities and participation. But these domains can be affected by individual contextual factors which represent a person's circumstances and background and include both environmental and personal factors. There was also this concept of the quality of life, which is quite complex and encompasses many characteristics of an individual's social, cultural, economic, and physical environments, as well as his physical and mental health status. Now, the head THS is the most commonly used physical examination score that assesses swelling, uh, muscle atrophy, crepitus, range of movement, joint pain, and strength. So six index joints, that's the knees, the elbows, and the ankles, are scored on certain predefined criteria to give a score of 20 into six. That's 120, plus another four extra points for the gait. Now, X-rays are scored using the Peterson score that looks at various changes like subchondral cysts 
osteoporosis, narrowing of joint space, and other criteria that gives us a total score of 13 into 6, that's 72 points. Now, however, as x-rays were not sensitive to early change, tools using the ultrasound and MRI scan were developed. Now, all that ultrasound imaging can detect joint effusion and early joint disease. But there's emerging evidence that suggests that musculoskeletal ultrasound may be useful in the clinical point of care assessment and management of pay, painful hemophilic arthropathy as it can differentiate between joint bleeds and joint inflammation. However, one thing needs to be mentioned that in any circumstance, if a patient or clinician suspects an acute joint or muscle bleed or has difficulty assessing whether a bleed is in progress, one should pro proceed with the necessary hemostatic treatment immediately before performing any of these confirmatory investigations or awaiting such results. Now the head ultrasound shown here, the jade ultrasound or the more comprehensive Toronto Utric Velo ultrasound scoring systems have been validated for use in hemophilia. And while the MRI is likely the most sensitive measure of joint structure, it is expensive, time consuming and difficult to perform in small children. The IPSG MRI scan is the example shown here. Now, however, x-rays and other radiological assessment do not tell the full story. When one looks at the x-ray of the hemophilic elbow on the right and compares it with the normal x-ray on the left, one would assume that the elbow would be very painful, degenerate, and would have poor function. However, this is the same elbow with relatively pain-free, good range of movement. So function and structure do not necessarily correlate, especially in hemophilia. Hence, it is necessary to look at the other aspects of the ICF, like the activities and participation. Most tools that study these aspects assess the domains of both activities and participation together rather than as separate domains. So these instruments include disease specific instruments like the hemophilia activity list, the PEDHAL and the probe, as well as other generic instruments like the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure or the COPUM and the MACTA. Now, the HAL is a self-assessment questionnaire and assesses 42 activities in seven domains. That's, you know, lying down, sitting, kneeling, standing, functions of the leg, functions of the arm, use of transportation, self-care, household tasks, and leisure activities and sports. Now, while the HAL was developed for adults, the PEED HAL was developed for children. And so to complement the self-reported HAL, a performance-based assessment tool, the FISH, or the functional independent score for hemophilia was developed to objectively measure the patient's functional ability. It assesses eight activities, that is eating, grooming, dressing, chair transfers, squatting, walking, step climbing, and running. Now these are graded from one to four according to the amount of assistance required to perform them. And both have good psychometric properties. Now, however, it is important to assess outcomes from patient's perspective and hence patient reported outcomes that help guide treatment are necessary. For example, now looking at the x-ray, one would assume that this patient would require help with ambulation and help in getting around, and this would be his main problem. But when we administered the COPUM to him, he did acknowledge that climbing steps, walking, and using public transport were difficult. However, this patient, who was a teacher, did not come to us for problems with his lower limb. When you look at his assessment of his disability, it is quite different. Now, he could not reach the backboard, blackboard due to difficulties in his shoulder, and this was his main issue. Now, he adapted himself well to his inability to walk by using a wheelchair and did not feel that this needed to be addressed at this stage. So his personal and environmental factors had a significant role in his assessment of disability. So it should be recognized that there are environmental and personal factors that can affect outcome as well. Now, environmental factors that influence outcome include facilitators and barriers to treatment. So these may include access to comprehensive hemophilia care centers, availability of uh, factor concentrates, medical understanding, medical insurance coverage, and the travel distance to a hemophilia treatment center. So assessment of personal factors, such as a locus of control and uh, psychological characteristics, such as anger, depression, and optimism, can be used to guide and inform individual care or research. 
So it is important to assess the economic factors too, both direct and indirect. Now, direct costs include the cost of medical treatment and access to health service. Con uh, factor concentrate often account for 90% of the treatment-related costs. Indirect costs arising um, from the loss of work productivity of adult patients and in parents or pediatric patients, the time they spend managing the children's hemophilia care is to be considered. Now, hemophilia-related quality of life measurements are usually questionnaires that aim to quantify a patient's health in a global way. Now, however, it is best applied in combination with specific assessments of the ICF domains rather than in isolation. So generic instruments like the EQ5D and the SF36 are useful. And um, disease-specific tools like the probe, chocolate, and the hemoqual A have been used to assess the quality of life in hemophilia. So patient reported outcomes, including both uh, single-dimensional and multi-dimensional measures of symptoms, uh, HRQOL, the health status and adherence to treatment, satisfaction with treatment and other measures. Often, they are cumulative outcome measures and may not provide adequate insight into the problems that give rise to a diminished quality of life score. They're often affected by psychosocial factors and hence may have limited value in targeting interventions. So in conclusion, the WFH recommends assessing and documenting the musculoskeletal and overall health of each patient at least annually. Now, this should include an assessment of body structure and function, activity levels, participation and health-related quality of life as per the WHO's ICF, and as much as possible in the right clinical context. So uh, while the WFH World Bleeding Disorders Registry provides a platform for hemophilia treatment centers to collect uniform and standardized patient data, details of the outcome assessment instruments can be accessed at the website shown here. That is a WFH compendium of assessment tools. So the web page is what's shown here. So in summary, in order to optimize treatment and make economically sound clinical decisions, objective evidence of both short and long-term outcomes of treatment regimes is required. Both generic and hemophilia specific assessment instruments make it possible to evaluate the nature of the physical impairments and functional limitations and the impact on the lives of people with hemophilia and their families. And the increasing use of these instruments will standardize assessment and permit comparison of data between individuals and cohorts. And I'd like to thank the Hemophilia Alliance team for help with preparation of these slides.